This is D. Calhoun, a.k.a. Screaming Mad D, the voice of Spiral Grave and solo artist on Argonauta Records. You, my friend, are listening to the Brutally Delicious Podcast. <laughs> hello some things never change right no they don't and they never will <laughs> dude i feel like we're back where we started again you're here we got it i'm good to go brother hey good to see you d you got video now um when i checked it it was good i'll uh, start video there, there, we go. Go. there we go good to see you my friend that's my partner chris hey how you doing hello. chris good how are you man good thanks good. for monday yeah for monday you're right thanks for, for monday. time i know you're busy that's a tall ass ceiling you got there man that's the angle <laughs> <laughs> it's that old ronnie dio angle you shoot from below you know yeah i can't do that otherwise it's all chin you know right so. <laughs> well, that's what this is for <laughs> and if you shoot from the top it'll be blinded by his head so it'll all oh dude don't even talk to me about my ball <laughs> well that's okay? that's you know under here i got rid of all of it so this is actually everything's by design so this is actually a uh a uh a glare screen um looking Maybe you should recommend one for chris <laughs> <laughs> i need something because here, you know close put your glasses on all right there we go otherwise uh, let me, otherwise you're gonna see this you know right. <laughs> for yeah. a half an hour <laughs> last time i was part of a video shoot they used my head as the white balance oh. but, <laughs> <laughs> nice so anyway d thank you for joining us i know we've done a lot of stuff together through the past with iron man and a bunch of my video stuff and yeah so tell us about Give us the two sentence boardroom elevator pitch for the uh, newer stuff, D. Calhoun. Uh, swampy, heavy, acoustic Americana doom. Wow. You were prepared <laughs> for that one. That's pretty good. And uh, that encompasses everything. I'm never prepared. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually just listening to Old Scratch Comes to Appalachia. Or mm -hmm. App Is that how I say that? I'm Canadian. Well, you know, I usually, anytime I use the word in, in conversation, I say Appalachia. I was yeah. actually born and raised in Appalachia, but for purposes of this album, I say Appalachia because, okay. and this is just my perception, Appalachia sounds more backwoodsy to me. Okay, and, cool. And it really isn't, you know, it's right. like data and data, you know, it's <laughs> this, two versions of the same word, but that's just been my perception of it so. salsa 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 yeah. <laughs> Anyways. Yes. either way is acceptable cool um so you you say you come from that area so like when i was checking out the song and the video and reading the story about it it kind of seems like a dark place well i could write about anywhere and make it sound like a dark place <laughs> that's just fair enough where i come from creatively um it could definitely be argued that uh, Appalachia is a dark place, um, you know, with uh, with the witches and the and the backwoods and the old ways, you know, as it were. Um, yeah. So it's it's definitely a uh, a good place to go creatively for those kinds of themes and whatnot. Yeah, we did an interview with a band from there. I can't remember how many years ago. But he answered the Zoom call and he was holding the gun and he was just shooting it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Jesus. That's the old ways. Well, actually, the old ways, you know, would you know, involve um, a uh, 
a dead chicken and uh Dude, blood on the floor. He was drinking <laughs> a beer and it was like nine o'clock in the morning and he had a an AK I, or something in his hand. Yeah, yeah. He was ready to just he was just like I'm shooting gophers and watching for meth heads. <laughs> 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 All right. I forgot about that. That's great. <laughs> 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 Jesus. I didn't mean to take it down that road. I was just, you know. Um, so what was so you're inspired to write this story and, and convert it. Like it looks here like you're writing a book and the album mm -hmm. is kind of part of it. Um Yeah. How does that how does that kind of happen for you? Well, it's there was a precedent for it. On my second album, Go to the Devil, I wrote a song called Jesus the Devil the Deed. Um and when I finished the song, I thought to myself, there's more to this story. I want to know what the what the rest, not the rest of the story, but I want to know more about the guts of the story. So I wrote a, a novella that be, that was my second published book, the uh, novella version of the narrative of that song. Um, when I wrote Old Scratch Comes to Appalachia, the song, I told my son about it. And he says, is this going to be another book? <laughs> and I, I said, no, I said, the narrative is not long enough. And at that point, I had just published a novel and I wanted to do another novel. And he said, well, you should write it as a book and then release them the same day. And I'm like, fuck, you know, why didn't I think of that? Right? <laughs> um, and, and that's where it went. Um, I didn't want to just release uh, a single 90 page book novelette so i decided to flesh it out and i wrote three other stories to accompany it sort of the same theme you know devil goes to the backwoods and and wreaks various kinds of hell on the townsfolk in different places in different ways and that's that's sort of where the book came from but yeah the song and the story are connected they're the basically the same story but the song was first yes yeah nice that's very cool and your son's like hey you should do a book and you're like <laughs> Damn it! I was, I was very disappointed in myself <laughs> that I didn't think of that idea, and I told him that, uh, you know, for his uh, for his great suggestion, you know, he was going to make uh, just as much money as I'm going to make from it. So, uh, <laughs> right. So here's a question: Since you're a writer, uh, both musician and obviously uh, written word, how do you feel about the advancements of machine learning and? Are you using it to help your creative process? Are you worried about how it's going to affect your creative process? What do you think about all of it? Um, it's neither here nor there for me where creativity is concerned. Um, I am leery about it and would never employ it. Um, I don't see how you could be proud of that as a as a as a writer and a musician um to have something else generate your content for you mm -hmm. um, i think it is something you know that's on the horizon well it's, it's here. here yeah um to be wary of um and it all comes around to the consuming public you know they're the ones that are eventually going to dictate whether it's used or not, are they going to consume it? Are they going to care? Um, or are they going to know? Well, and that's true too. They already are consuming it and they don't. Know. Right. Um, <clears throat> I enjoy some of the novelty that it creates, you know, when you can download a, uh, or listen to a version of Plankton from SpongeBob singing War Pigs. <laughs> um, and if, if it could stop right there. Right. Then I would say, oh, yeah, this is great, but it's it's not going to stop there. And it's it's all the way up to the to the degree where the Beatles are going to employ it to release a uh, an unreleased song that uh, the I'm John wrote, right. um, yeah. that they're going to AI generate John's vocals. Um, Crazy. So it is. It is, it is a frightening slope that uh, we're looking down. Um, and not just for the reasons of, you know, we all saw T2 Judgment Day. Right. Um, you know, and I don't want to be that dramatic about it. But yeah, from the creative standpoint, it is kind of distressing. Um, I think it's I distressing. 
I think it's distressing for every single industry, unless you're like a plumber or an electrician, right, or in the trades, right, right. Because like as as like think about coders right now, right? That's like one of the highest paying jobs there is. Like if you go to Loudoun County, Virginia, the richest county in the United States, the only reason it's there is because of coders, right? It's all right. IT people and coding. What happens when the computer just does that for you? Because it already can, you know, right. not not perfectly, but it can it can get pretty close. Banks, yeah. lawyers, judges, accountants, all those all those white collar jobs are at total risk. And people don't see that. People are all people see is how it impacts the arts. And you've got a huge degree of people that are like, you know, oh, who cares about that? Yeah. You know? Right. Um, but yeah, they don't stop to consider how far reaching it'll be. And uh, this is why I think the SAG after strike that's going on right now might be one of the most important strikes in history. Yes. Right. Because they're actually going to be the on the front lines. They're the ones deciding what's going to be allowed in their industry mm -hmm. with machine learning and artificial intelligence. And, and that's going to be used as a basis for every single thing that comes over the next few years. Right. Because it's not, it's not going to happen tomorrow, but by next year, we're going to start to see huge impacts and the year after and the year right. after it's just going to get more and more. And I see so many people who are, who are downplaying this strike and even denouncing it or ridiculing it because all they look at are the rich celebrities involved. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're not looking at the crew people. They're not looking the at the grips, the writer, you know, everyone who's impacted, who are living paycheck to paycheck and gig to gig based on this. Yeah. And, um, you know, they just so many people refuse to look at the bigger picture and the bigger impact of it. And, um, you know, I fear they're not going to until it's too late. Well, what about then, what about the curiosity factor? <clears throat> like, like you have to be curious about how it would impact your work, right? Absolutely. And um, it's like, how many people can avoid that curiosity factor? Right. I mean, it's it's like the uh, onset of uh, automation. You know, yeah, a hundred years ago, one hundred and fifty years ago, whatever. Um, and I, I wonder how many people see it as a fad that's not going to catch on, but <laughs> oh, it's too late. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. My curiosity factor got me with it. And I wrote code that I had no business writing because I don't code. And I wrote a program that took weeks of work that used to take me weeks. I now do in a minute and a half. Right. Right. Well, and you I'm know, like, I have, holy shit. I have a children's book written that I've had sitting you know finished uh copy wise for about four years now um and i know i could go out and employ ai to illustrate it mm -hmm. and be done with it but i'm not going to do that you know i uh go ahead i was gonna say i'm gonna jump in real quick and we can probably get back to d in a second but i'm taking a course this summer as chris knows on ai imaging mm-hmm in uh, you know the college I, I work for, and I'm blown away. Chris and I have conversations via email like a hundred times a day, going, "Holy shit, the stuff you can do!" Right. But let me ask you a question: Is if you're create if you're creating art, or if you're creating based off your text, is that still art? Chris, that's that's something that's going to be debated. Um, if it's the artist creating it, how is it considered? Because um, you still have to get those prompts right. What'd you call it, Chris? It's a prompt. Prompt, prompt engineering. Yeah. So, I mean, you still have to get those prompts right. So, I mean, there's work in it. Right. That's that's the kind of thing that, that people will use to justify it if they really employ it. Um, whereas for me, this is some, th this, this, particular project is something I visited and, you know, then I come back and poke around for an illustrator for a little bit and get involved in something else. But this is definitely something that when it gets done and gets finished, 
it's going to be someone sitting down either doing digital art right or or drawing it and scanning it right that's going to end up in it and for all i know the person that i employ to do it might use ai on their end um right. that's the other thing you don't even know right 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 um i i don't see myself consciously employing ai to do yeah. to Fair do enough. that sort of thing and certainly where my music is concerned i've always been very do it yourself i record all of my music at home nice um the only outsourcing i do is i do take it and get it mastered um but so you I, record and mix at home yeah yeah it's all nice. done done right in my bedroom nice. and that's where i do a lot of my writing too and um that's just the way i prefer to do it you know i do this for my own amusement as much as i do for anything else and part of the accomplishment is listening to something like old scratch comes to appalachia and thinking wow i was sitting in my chair in my bedroom and that's where this was produced right. and i think that's pretty cool you know that's the one thing that i love about digital audio is mm -hmm. it's really empowered the creatives to have access to something that they didn't have access to before unless right. they had financial backing right you know, like i remember when i was trying to record a record back when i was in my 20s studio time was like 13 to 1500 dollars a day in mm -hmm. the 90s right you know, i could i couldn't afford that no, I've uh, I've told many people that if if my solo music required me booking studio time to to produce it, there wouldn't be any solo music. Um, I'm able to do it because I can do it myself. Yeah, and I wonder if that's another, also a different way of looking at machine learning. Like maybe it's going to empower people. <clears throat> excuse me, to have uh, access to things that they didn't have access to before. Mm -hmm right it's so it's such a complex subject to me yeah there it, it 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 depends so much on point of view and it, we're, we're just at the tip of the iceberg regarding well it. i i applaud you for staying away from it and doing it you know artistically especially when you know you could get it done quicker like chris said by just logging on and doing it. So putting the time in and, you know, the grit and the sweat is pretty cool. And I well, think it shows. That's that's a great deal of a fun part. I mean, you know, when you sit down and you're like, okay, I'm going to start working on an album. You want you want the finished product. You know, that's your, 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 your end game is to have that finished product. But part of the joy is the creation and hearing it come together and building soundscapes and just hearing the parts fit together and uh just that that adrenaline rush when you know you nail that vocal part you know and and uh and you know i nail the vocal part and the neighbors aren't beating on my wall <laughs> right. um, is that yeah that's 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 part of the joy of it um so here's here's kind of an odd question since you both write books and write music do you kind of have two not two personalities per se but do you approach creativity differently with one form or the other? Not really. Um, they're kind of just uh, two heads of the same beast. Um, you know, as far as, as the, the, as the joy that comes from it, when I wrote my novel, that's when I realized, Hey, I get as much joy out of writing stories and books as I do out of writing music. Um, and that's that's the big driving force with me uh creatively is is it fun you know is, is this something that if i came across from someone else would i go out and pick it up and that's that's kind of what i go for um writing books won't ever replace music because music has the live performance factor behind it um you can go out and read a book have a live reading or whatnot but it's it's not the same mm -hmm. but um no it's it's kind of just coming up with an idea and and going with it and seeing it coming together and um 
just the excitement that comes from the creative process. Right. Um, yeah. So that's, that's kind of the big thing for me, just the fun. It is exciting, that. isn't it? Oh, I, you know, I, I tell people since I do all of my own production and all of my own art layouts, when I get a physical copy of an album, there isn't that joy that there used to be because I've already listened to it thousands of times while I was producing it. I've already looked at the artwork dozens of times while I was creating it. But when I get a copy of a book, I've only looked at that on a computer screen while I was working on it. You know, when I get that hard copy of a book and can just flip through the pages, that's over overwhelming joy to sit there as, you know, as, as someone who started reading Poe in grade school and being around books my entire life, just there's still that, that sense of, Oh wow, this, this, that came out of here. Right. And, um, and that's that by itself is worth the effort. Um, anything beyond that, you know, people picking it up, people reaching out with, uh, with, uh, good words about it. That's just the icing on the cake, but just the sense of accomplishment. That's, that's what I tell anyone who's creative, you know, you know, if, if, if you, if you want to draw the picture, draw it. Um, don't worry about what other people think about it. If you feel accomplished by it and get joy out of it, that's, it doesn't matter who's you've already, right. you've already won. I see you stay, you know, I keep up with you and we talk quite a bit as well. Um, I see you stay pretty good, pretty busy live. Mm -hmm. You got a lot of stuff coming up, right? It's starting to fill in. Um, it seems like, you know, I'll look at my calendar and think, no, oh, it's kind of lean for the next month and a half. And then all of a sudden things start to fill in. But uh, yeah, between playing solo and playing with Spiral Grave, um, and I've uh, kind of picked up a third gig. Um, a year ago, a little over a year ago, I started recording with a singer-songwriter uh, here in town, um, April Sandy, who I met at an open mic. And I've started, whenever possible, playing live with her. Nice. So, um, you know, that's going on, too. So um, it's from your neck of the woods, Chris, or your old neck of the woods, the D.C. area. Yeah, oh, I yeah. Live in, Fre live in Frederick. OK, cool. Yes. Yeah. Nice. yeah. Yeah. I lived in uh, I lived in Sterling for a long time. OK. Five, five and a half years, something like that. Right. Right. Yeah. Do you find it difficult keeping up with all those uh, projects and not knowing who you're writing for or what you're doing? Well, it's. It's very cut and dried, you know, when, when April book shows, you know, I tell her I'll keep the solo schedule clear, but if, a, if the band gets offered a gig that day, I got to take the band gig because there are other folks involved. So right. there, there's, there's a structured priority. Um, now April and I will do a lot of shows together that I'm on the bill solo as well. So I'll be doing double duty. Nice. playing her set and then playing my set later. So there always is a, uh, a sort of a pecking order. So there aren't overlaps or conflicts or sorry, guys, I can't take the, the band gig. I'm right. you know, doing this. Um, so that helps out a lot. The un There's a, a good understanding with it. So, okay. yeah. so, so I know besides, the besides three musical projects, a novel, a new album, <laughs> uh, children's book, um, do you sleep? I have people all the time that say, don't you ever relax? And my answer is, well, this is how I relax. Um, if I spend an evening working on music, I will go to bed that night just feeling like, wow, this was a really productive evening. Um, even if it's just coming up with a riff and noodling it and just throwing it down on the phone, you know, for reference later, there's, there's still this feeling of, okay, tonight was productive. You know, I got something, something done, um, for, for later on. So that's, that's what I do to relax. Um, right now I'm at it. I don't want to see a creative lull, but right now I'm not working on anything, 
but I am prepping uh, later this year. I'm going to start on another novel, um, probably <laughs> probably around the holiday time. Um, I'm between now and then just collect notes and organization and and that sort of thing, and then dive into that. So novel first, and then possibly a soundtrack second. Um. Well. <laughs> My follow up to Old Scratch is already recorded. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, last fall, um, the creative bug hit hard. And um, I started writing and recording. And before I knew it, um, there were 10 new songs. And, um, and they were good enough. I was, I, I, I'm happy enough with them that I'm like, Ooh, do I want to release this one instead? But uh, just the, the cross marketing with Old Scratch was just to me such a cool idea, right? Um, that I just uh, hung in with that and just tucked the other one away. So, um, so where can people go get the record? Where can people get the the books? Give us uh, a plug. The books are the easiest to find online. Uh, Amazon carries everything. I publish through Kindle Direct, um, which is partnered with Amazon. So Amazon carries everything. Um, most are available in Kindle as well as, as hard copy. Um, music you can order straight from Argonauta Records. Um, and everything is on the... Uh, the internet, all the uh, standard digital sites, you know, Spotify, iTunes. Um, all D Calhoun? Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, something worth noting about the new album, um, it is a two-disc set. Um, CD1 is the album. CD2 is the old scratch comes to Appalachia novelette in audiobook form. Oh, that's cool. Oh, cool. Yeah. That's really cool. Um, the only digital outlet that carries both CDs is Bandcamp. On Bandcamp, you can download both the album, 10 songs, and the audiobook. Nice. Um, and that was tedious work right there. <laughs> <laughs> audiobook editing is painful. And, you know, and that, that was the, the, the hard part. Each chapter is... 10 to 12 minutes long. So it would take 15 minutes to record. Um, the editing would take an hour and a half. Right. You know, chapter. just going, going through, getting ready, getting rid of all the mumbled words, you know, cleaning out the background sound, everything that was. Right. It, it was clicks. <laughs> yes. But worth it in the end. <laughs> That's nice. I love the whole true DIY spirit, though. You got it going on for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's it. It's just it's it's more fun to me that way, especially with this stuff. Um, just and you know, when I when I wrote my first novel, I was intimidated to write a novel, something that long form, and I wanted to take a creative writing class, um, mainly to learn organization, things like that. Right. And then COVID happened, and finally, I'm like, you know what? Everything else that I do, I do with a wing and a prayer by the seat of my pants. Why should this be any different? So I just wrote outlines and got everything organized and just had at it. So good for you. Yeah, that's thank you. That's um, that's just it's more fun for me to do it that okay. way. Well, that's all my questions, Chris. I don't have anything either. I think this was a great interview, man. Thank you. Thank D, you. I, and while I have you, D, I appreciate all you do, man. All the uh, silly shit you do with me. <laughs> From cooking here with Iron Man, I don't even know when that was, like 10 years ago, maybe? That was 2014. Wow. Oh, I was close, so almost yeah. 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. They showed up here, Chris. He was on a, he was in a band called Iron Man. They were on Metal Blade. They showed okay. up and cook. Uh, I don't even remember what we made. back. We then. made uh, beef stir fry. Really? Yeah. That's funny. You got a better. I just remember Al hanging out and... Yeah, and then over the years, D actually narrated uh, a couple of my movies. I think Metal Missionaries, probably Metal Missionaries, uh, Appalachian Black Metal. Oh yeah. Um. So yeah, nice. yeah, and I, I, I love doing that that sort of thing. When you reached out to me for Metal Missionaries, 
and uh, I recorded the uh, the test for you. Right. And I listened to that, and I thought, Ugh, that sounds horrible. And when you came back at me and it was like, oh, this is perfect, you know, I, I was floored. Yeah. Um, but, you even uh, did a uh, you even did a narrative on one of those audio dramas. For yes. Me. Yes. I yeah. I just, I, yeah. I love I love doing that sort of thing. Um, you know, anything that can allow me to be creative and and have fun with it, and it's it it always looks good on the resume. You know? Oh yeah. So I'm and not going to downsell that part of it. Thank you, my friend D. It's always good to see you. Thank you, my friend. All right. Cheers, man. Hey, you be too. well. And we'll talk Take to you. Take care, soon. fellas. Right out. Later. Bye. Yes. Bye.